Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the inner workings of the creative process. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. Desiree Attaway, founder and principal of the Attaway Group, is one of the nation's preeminent diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant facilitators. She has over 25 years of experience creating, leading, and managing international multicultural teams through major organizational change. She also leads the annual Whiteness at Work program, which I took in 2020. When she sent an email a few months ago about the intersection of creativity and liberation, and was leading a journaling workshop, I immediately wanted to know more about how she sees that intersection, so I invited her to the podcast. As you'll hear, we delve deep into the ways equity work and creativity are similar, which may surprise you, from perfectionism to self-judgment to how to use journaling as a tool for your own freedom as well as the collective good, you'll find a lot here to think on and explore. Here's my conversation with Desiree Attaway. Desiree, welcome to Follow Your Curiosity. I have been looking forward to this conversation since we set it up a couple months ago, and I kind of can't believe that we're here already. (laughs) No worries. So I start out by asking everybody about their creative history. Were you a creative kid, or is it something you found later? Oh, I was not a creative kid at all. Um, I I actually found it in my 50s. Well, let me step back. So, no, I think the first time I really found it was in my late mid 40s when I quit my the last job that I had when I worked for somebody else. And the day I quit, I did. There are three things that I always dreamed of doing that I never did. And I did two of them. I paid um, for a meditation class. And I bought paints and canvases because I'd always dreamed of painting. And the third thing I'd always dreamed of is surfboarding, um, surfing. So, but I always tell people, like, I would see people painting and would get a deep, like, a physical ache in my stomach when I would see other people painting because I really wanted to do it. So why didn't you? Um, I think in part because, you know, I, as a black woman was always told that, you know, like that, that was frivolous. That was, um, not something for me to give my time and attention to. Um, and so I didn't, and I definitely regret not kind of tapping into that part of myself. I think a lot of a lot of us hear messages like that, but it's it's so clear in the fact that every time you saw someone doing it, you felt it so deep inside yourself that you know it wasn't going to go away. I would get get so like just jealous. Like I would be green. I would be so angry when I saw other people painting because I I just always wanted to do that. Yeah. And I, and I just bought them. I just bought paints and canvas and said, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So what happened after you bought it? I, I would paint. I, I set up a easel on my front porch and I would just go outside and just throw paint all over these <laughs> canvases. And I did it over and over and over again and just loved it. So you weren't getting in your way saying, I don't know what I'm doing and this is terrible. No. And I was like, literally, I'm just throwing paint any way that I felt like it on this canvas. And I didn't get in my head about it. I didn't. um, There was no judgment. And I was still to this day, like, maybe you should take a painting class. That could probably be helpful. Um, But I still have it. I just... I just, um, now I, I do more inks and, um, uh, paper crafting than actual painting, even though I went on vacation last week and I took watercolors with me, um, and painted while I sat around a pool for a little bit. (laughs) That's a beautiful image. It was nice. It was very nice. I bet. So 
since you came to it so late, have there been things that have surprised you about discovering this creative part of yourself? Um, I think one of the things is that I, I am not judgmental about what my art looks like. I think I see my art being more of some, you know, kind of inner expression trying to be set free. So if the page looks like just a bunch of stuff on it, then that's what I needed that day in that moment. Um, which is which is nice because I'm I can be very um hard on myself in a lot of other ways, but for some reason I'm not super hard on myself when it comes to this. Because I feel like it's more of a it's more nour- nourishment for me. Right. So I, I see it like food and water. I, like, why am I fighting those things? Like I need those things. And I need I need art. I think you've just hit on something that so many people don't realize is true about the creative process, which is that we need it. That it's just like feeding yourself in any other way. And and I love that you are really seeing it as a process rather than an attempt to create a product that has to please someone, whether that's you or someone else. So I, in, in the work that I do, I spend a lot of time talking about perfection and how perfection um, is one of the reasons that we don't get to be connected to community in real ways. And perfection is one of the, um, reasons that we don't have the conversations we need to have and work equity um, and anti-racist work. And so I actually refuse to bring perfectionism into my art space. I've never seen where perfectionism has helped anybody get anywhere. Um, And so for me, that is because of all the work and research that I've done around perfectionism and how it shows up. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just one thing that I, I will not bring into that space. Um, and I think that has, that has given me a lot of freedom to even just try to try new forms of art that maybe I didn't think like I never thought I would get into like paper art and uh but I have and I've really been enjoying it it's fascinating to me but you know it makes perfect sense that you came to study perfectionism before you got to the creative side and that's why you're so free in what you do creatively and I'm wondering how I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this question. How did, how did you hit on perfectionism as such an issue in the diversity work that you do? And what, what really has struck you about what you've learned about it? Yeah. So it's, um, uh, Tima Okun and, um, I think his name is Billy Jones, but Tima Okun has like the characteristics of white supremacy. And perfectionism is one of them, right? It's in this desire to be perfect, right? Like who gets to determine what perfect is? And what has this deep sense of trying to be perfect done to us as humans? And I, and I will say specifically done to folks who are maybe identify as um, as a female, uh, you know, or gender nonconforming, like the ways that society tells us we have to be perfect in all that we do and think and look. Um, so it's a real, for me, that is, that is something that I'm like, art for me is healing. It is, it is oxygen. It is um, soul restoring. And I cannot let that come into the space like that. I have to, this is, um, I mean, it's holy to me in a lot of ways. And so I I can't let anything that would gaslight me or gaslight what I'm creating come in. I think more of us need to think of that space that way. 
Uh, yeah, it's, I, I um, I've been really trying to see it as essential and core, like everything else that happens in my day. Right, brush my teeth. I walk a little bit. Right, get some kind of movement in, and I'm gonna do some kind of art, something. Even if it's just me playing with inks and pens and doodling for a little bit, um, I have to give that to myself. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to view it that way. And even more beautiful if you can manage to fit it into your day. Even, you know, I always tell people, even if it's only five minutes, it, it's better than not doing it at all and then saying, oh, wow, I haven't done anything in five years. Yeah, no, totally. Hey, right. This is a this is a bomb for for I think when we especially think about folks with marginalized identities and how much trauma that we are constantly living with um, that is in us that we carry that we work in. This is not optional. This is essential for me to be able to thrive and navigate these spaces. So how did discovering art then change how you work as a diversity consultant and and that kind of work that you do? How was it before and how is it different now? Well, I think actually one of the key essential pieces to the way that I do my work is it's always process over product, right? And I brought that into my art. It is not just that we do the work, but it's really how we do the work for me and and my equity work that is super important. I'm not going to replicate systems of harm. And so I think I've bought in that process and centering process over product. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It matters that I sat in the chair and gave myself those 15 minutes. It doesn't matter if anybody else ever sees this. It matters that I know that I gave myself that. Yeah. yeah. And I I was reading um, a transcript of a podcast that you did, Michael Bungay Steiner. Um, and I'll put a link to it in the, the show notes so everybody can take a look. But one of the things that you mentioned was a quote from Erica Hines about knowing that you have to be humble because you're going to fumble. And I feel like that is like such a perfect direct line. Mm-hmm. between equity work and knowing that you're not going to go in on the first day and get it right, especially if, you know, you've never explored this kind of work before. And the same is true when you start a creative process, you know, you're going to go in and you're going to just like be clueless and make mistakes, but that's also how you learn. Yeah. And I would actually push that even if you've been doing it for 15, 20 years, you're still going to go in and be clueless and it's still going to be something new. You're still going to make mistakes. And so, uh, you know, we always talk about in the work that I do, it's not not if you're going to make a mistake, it's when you're going to make a mistake and how are you going, right? So we talk up front, how are we going to handle it when that mistake is made? How are we going to apologize? How are we going to stay in right relationship with each other? And I can take that and lay that right over my art. Like, it's not if I'm going to mess something up, it's when. And how am I going to be good and kind to myself? How am I going to stay in right relationship with myself and my creative muse when that happens? And And as, no, go ahead. I was going to say, and to think about that prior to it. Right. And thinking about how, how am I treat myself that day that I'm like, this is crap. I'm cra-. like, what am I going to give myself that I need so that I can come back the next day and, and, and be fully present with the, with the art and the creativity. And I feel like there is, there's a magic in saying it's not if, but when it's like an invitation to accept in advance all of the flaws, all of the stumbles, anything that could possibly, it it really, it feels like an invitation to just accept that you are fully human and therefore totally imperfect. And just listening to you say that, I could feel myself kind of loosen up, sort of like, you know, you go into a, a DEI workshop and can be all 
I don't know what's going to happen and I'm nervous about this and I'm going to, you know, either stay in the back and say nothing or open my mouth and look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. Just like you can get all hung up about whatever art you're doing and be, I want this to be absolutely perfect. And I, you know, I can't afford, I can't afford a new canvas. I have to make it perfect this time. But if you decide in advance, it's not going to be perfect. It's not a matter of if I mess up, but when it lets you breathe more. Yeah. It takes away these binaries that we all live under. Right. And so it is this either or thinking I get it right or it's wrong. Not that it is what it is. Um, Yeah. That either or thinking is what destroys a lot of us. Um, And so I think for me, it's how do I think about this art and not bringing that either or thinking, but more of a, how can I explore it and how can I be kind of curious about, whatever those next steps are with it. Yeah. I think the curiosity is, is super important with both because if we're not willing to ask questions and see what happens next and even be curious about when I'm going to screw up, I'm not sure we can do much else. Yeah. No. Well, the other thing there, so if we're just thinking about the equity work, is how do I apologize when I make mistakes? Because I know I'm going to make a mistake. I know I'm going to cause harm. So how do I own that? How can I be transparent about that? How can I be account- accountable? And what does accountability look like? And I again, I think we can t- take that around art. Is It's not the intent, it's the impact. And, and how can I own a, and be accountable? and accountability is not punitive. That's that's the way white supremacy and capitalist society wants us to think about it. Like that, oh, you made this mistake, Nancy. You're broken. You're horrible. You are a mistake, right? You weren't perfect. You didn't get it right. And I think the reality is if we're going to be accountable, that actually is an opportunity for us to get in deeper relationship with each other, right? That's an opportunity for Nancy to say, hey, Desiree, you, you know, you messed up, but let me, let's hold each other with great care as we figure out what to do next. But we're all scared of accountability because, yeah. right, we're all frightened of it. And I always tell people all the time, we only hold people accountable that we care about. If I don't care about you, I don't hold you accountable. You can go do what you want. And so I think there's something there around our creativity, around what's holding us. One, how do we stay in right relationship with our creativity? How do we treat it and be really good with it and hold it with great care? And I'm wondering, you know, for those who may not have encountered this kind of concept before, what? What would a good, I'm not sure I want to say apology because I'm not sure that that covers everything, but you know, if, if I realized that I had done or said something that, you know, thoughtlessly, cluelessly, you know, whatever had caused someone harm, what would a good productive kind of accountability look like in that kind of situation? Yeah. So that is us apologizing for impact, not intent. So I always think about it. Nancy, you and I are working together. I go to Starbucks. I bring you back a really beautiful hot latte, bubbling hot latte. I spill it on you and your computer. Coffee's everywhere. You are burned. And I'm like, oh my God, Nancy, I'm so sorry. I'm an idiot. I'm a moron. Look at what I did. I can't believe I did this. Well, take that aside. You are still literally burning. So the focus has to be on how do I stop the harm in that moment? Right? Hey, you come over here. 
grab Nancy's laptop. You tell people we're leaving. I'm taking Nancy to the doctor. We'll be back, right? I'll fix all this after I get Nancy taken care of. But then I have to come get you taken care of. I have to come back and I have to be like, Nancy, I'm going to get your laptop fixed, right? And I'm going to be more mindful when I'm handling hot liquids. So it's also showing change behavior because just saying you're going to do something doesn't mean anything unless you do it. Now, that first way I acted was all about me. Mm -hmm. As you were still sitting there burning, literally, right? But it was all about me and how I'm this and how the focus then became on me. I now do feel really bad about what I did. But, you know, I'm not going to process this with you, Nancy. I'm going to go find my sister or somebody else and be like, y'all, today was horrible. Look what I did. I really harmed this person. I'm really sorry. I have to make sure they're okay. I'll follow up in two or three days to see if they need anything else. Like, right? Like, I don't process that with you. And I think that's what we get wrong sometimes. We want to keep going back to the person we harmed, going, is it okay now? Like, are we okay now? Are we okay now? And the reality is that's not what they need, right? You need to go process that with somebody else. They need change behavior from you. Yeah. And I, I find myself wondering, you know, I don't think most of us even learn how to put together a good, meaningful apology. You know, a lot of no, us here as kids, you know, tell your brother you're sorry. And you're That's not sorry, not, right? They're like, right. tell your brother you're sorry you took that toy. But you're like, I'm not sorry I took that toy. Mm-hmm. We do not know how to apologize. And the other thing is we don't see it as a core leadership skill. I see that being able to apologize for impact, being able to stay in right relationship with people after you cause them harm, right? Being vulnerable in front of folks and saying, I absolutely did that, you know? And maybe what I do in our next meeting is I say, yo, I just want to apologize in front of everybody. Like, I want to give a formal apology to Nancy to what I did and how that happened, right? Like, we can't do that because again, we're so afraid that, What's the next action is punitive. Like now I'm going to get it. Because we, yeah, that's what happened in the past, right? Like we got in trouble for saying what we really want to say. (laughs) Yeah, we don't. And I think it's, for me, it's, it's a essential skill. We can't begin to have difficult conversations about anything. One, unless we trust one another and unless we know how do we, how do we repair? we cause harm. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm also seeing where there's that, that relationship between accountability and punishment. You know, I think there's a way to have accountability that does not involve raking somebody over the coals, but a lot of us really think that's exactly what it means. And that, you know, so we avoid it because we don't want to do that. Yeah. I always ask people, Don't tell me you want accountability when you want revenge. And don't tell me you want accountability when you actually want punishment. Because those are not the same thing. Accountability will always leave room for repair and room for relationships to continue to move forward. Yeah. And it requires a level of humility. You know, in your example about, you know, being a leader, it's amazing to me how many leaders don't seem to understand that it's not about pretending that you know everything and that you're perfect, that a good chunk of it is being humble enough to kind of, as I said before, admit that you are human and imperfect too. Yeah. Yeah. Like ego is a monster, right? And for a lot of people, it's, I can never admit that I'm wrong. And I'm like, I admit I'm wrong all the time, all the time, because I am wrong all the time. Like none of us, um, Again, that perfectionism. Yeah. The, yeah. It's, I've always said perfectionism is insidious, but I'm seeing a whole new level or seven of insidiousness as we're talking. Mm-hmm. It really, it really messes everybody up. It, it does. And I think when you, you know, when that intersects with the patriarchy, I think it 
does a particular, it's a, it's a very particular way that it messes up women. Can you say perfect. more about that? Well, I think, um, right, like it is around what is beautiful and all the ways that we feel like we have to be perfect to be considered worthy or of partners, of jobs, of relationships, of anything. Right. And how often do we put things off, like put off painting or, you know, anything because, you know, oh, no, it's not for me. I'm not I'm not that. I can't really draw very well, so I can't do art or I I don't you know, I I still can't draw a straight line with a ruler like I just they always come out wrong. But all, all the things, right, all the ways that we tell ourselves that we are not worthy because somehow we are lacking. We are not perfect. You know, as you're talking, I'm I'm thinking to last night online, I saw a reference to the old, I think it was whisk, the the laundry aid, those mm-hmm. old commercials from when I at least was a kid, you know, with ring around the collar and heaven forbid yep. your husband should have ring around the collar. And, you know, this was, you know, right around when feminism was having a big resurgence. But meanwhile, we have, you know, people playing housewives in ads feeling horribly ashamed because heaven forbid somebody should have ring around. The- Whoever saw ring around the collar for real? Well, and then, you know, also I'm of that same age, right? Like, these the commercial i can bring home the bacon fry up mm. like i can do everything right but uh, and in doing everything i have to do everything perfectly my house has to be clean my children like all the ways that we put all that energy into things that honestly 20 years from now will not matter 15 years from now 5 minutes from now won't matter and we put all this energy into that and not in our creativity and our art and the things that actually are healing to us. Yeah. And we decide that those things aren't important, yeah. which I think is even worse because then we think that we're being virtuous by not doing them when in fact, we're just hurting ourselves by not giving yeah. ourselves that kind of time. Yeah. And a part of it too is pressure too, right? Like, I don't know about you, but like if my mother comes in my house and my house is looking a mess. And I'm like, oh, I did art. Like the things I'm going to hear from her. And I'm 50 something. <laughs> but I was doing art. She's going to be like, what? Mm-hmm. Right? Why are there dishes in your sink? You know? Um, so we have to be willing, right? To put down some very fierce boundaries around this. Like, does anybody care about those dishes in my sink? They're going to be fine. They're going to be Okay. They'll make their way into the dishwasher. I'll wash them eventually. But right now, this is what I need. So we're always balancing those expectations. Yeah. A friend of mine used to say about things like that, you know, it'll wait. It'll still be there when you get a chance. I tell people, I've never saw a dish get up and walk out of my sink. Not yet. (laughs) So I think it'll be there. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. It'll wait the five minutes if that's all you can give to writing a poem or doing a little sketch or whatever it is that you want to do. It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere at all. No, no. So, so yeah, I, I, yeah. Like I said, I'm 56 and um, I'm so happy that I have the art in my life that I do. Yeah, it's it's a powerful thing and we tend to forget how powerful it is, which you know, brings me to how we got here. You sent out uh, an email a couple months ago offering a workshop on journaling and I think there might have been another one and I was so disappointed that I couldn't make it and that was when I thought this would be a really interesting podcast conversation. I want to know how yeah. Desiree Attaway sees the intersection of creativity and liberation. And we've kind of touched on that, but I would love to hear more about how yeah. you think those things intersect and also, you know, the journaling that you do with it, though we can break that down. You don't have to yeah. tackle it all at once. Yeah. So uh, the workshop that I did last fall was with um, my friend, Aaron Fairchild, 
who is on Instagram as um, journal as altar, right? And she talks about journaling and paper crafts as really a, as a vehicle and a medium to do your own interpersonal work around racial equity and oppression. And, um, and she actually is one who got me all into the level of inks that I have now in my possession. <laughs> is uh which is an addiction and i'm just going to call it what it is um and so so also what happens is for the past few summers i would do a program called sister summer and for the month of june folks would get writing prompts um and they get to kind of spend time writing on it and um aaron always would do sister summer and would use some of those writing prompts in her journaling. Um, and so we decided to do a class together and, you know, we're just talking about how for a long, long time, um, I always thought that community work was all like, that was the work for me. And there was never any of the creativity that went with it. Um, and that's one of those false messages and narratives from white supremacy is who gets to be an artist, whose art is acceptable, right? Um, and that's actually ultimately about power. Right? So when I'm, I'm teaching on power, one of the things I teach about is how time is power. And when we think about who had time, who had time to, for philosophy and for art and to think, right, and, and to create new inventions, like who, who was granted that, right? That's all about power. Yeah. And what art is seen as more valid than others. Um, and so... What I realized over the years is part of the ways we're socialized and indoctrinated into these systems tells us that there's only one way to be a Black woman. There's only one way to be a white woman. There's only one way to be a white man. Like, we're put in such tight boxes. And so, you know, if I listen to what how I've been socialized, it is that. Um, I get to compartmentalize my life in certain ways. And there are certain things I don't get to do or have or not seen as more valuable. And I just was like, that's not true, right? I get to be fully 100% whole. And in doing that, there's a part of my creativity that I also get to tap into and share and own that power, right? Um, and not let anybody else tell me when I can or cannot do this, what I can and cannot have. So for me, it is an essential step to liberation because part of the reason the system stay in place is we actually never have enough time to dream. We have, we never have enough. We think about like, what does new systems look like? We don't know because we haven't created them. Um, and the way the system is set up, we don't have time to sit down and really dream and think about it. And so for me, that's part of the art, right? That is giving me that time to dream and think about what that liberation is and looks like. Yeah. And it's also, it seems to me, a really fundamental but overlooked act of rebellion against all mm -hmm. of those things, you know, mm -hmm. like just saying, no, I get to be a whole person is pretty profound and something that a lot of people, it never even crosses their minds. But then to say, not only do I get to be a whole person, I get to engage with my creativity in, in an imperfect way yeah. because it's important to me and it's valuable to me. And I'm going to make the time, even if other things tell me I shouldn't have the time. I mean, that is really a profound statement. Yeah. And I'm not going to, like, I, I get to have this. You don't get to take this away from me. Right. And for me, that's really important. And I refuse to choose. Right. I get to have art as well as these other things in my life. And I get to determine what my priorities are. And if it ain't housekeeping this week, then it ain't housekeeping. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm wondering now, you know, what would happen if more people realized that that is a choice, not a situation that they have to, to agree to that, you know, they can actually stand up and say, no, I am going to take half an hour every day. You know, I mean, we don't have a problem saying I'm going to take half an hour to work out today. Right. You know, that is socially acceptable and even promoted. But if we do the same thing with creative work or journaling or whatever else, we tell ourselves that, you know, that's presumptuous or it's too much because that should just be optional because, you know, cleaning the house or whatever else should be more important. Well, and let's be clear too, when we push back against those norms, we get punished for them. Mm -hmm. Right. So to show up and do this work, we really do have to be brave, right? It is, it is an act of bravery to say, I don't care what y'all are thinking. I'm taking this time. Yeah. And I'm willing to deal with the consequences of that action. And it's empowering too, just, just to think that, you know, you can mm -hmm. feel it in your bones as you say it. Yeah. It's like, no. No, no. Right. So that's why I'm like, I'm not choosing. I'm not choosing. I get to have this. I get to actually be selfish about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I get to be selfish. And yet, in a way, it's it's selfish for you in the moment, maybe, but I feel like the benefit of it to each of us as individuals trickles out into society because we've taken the time to do something for ourselves, which makes us better people. You mm -hmm. know, it makes us less perfectionistic. It makes us more open. It's just plain a healing act, as you said earlier. So I think it's kind of both. Yeah. No, I think it is an incredibly sacred act of, and way of understanding me and my healing. Um, I think it is, it's a way for unlearning all the shoulds and that we have been taught all of our lives. Um, and I think it's a way of kind of questioning and unlearning those binaries, right? Um, that we all have. And so, yeah, I, I encourage. Everybody I know to find something, get, get yourself something. I'm tapping to it. With journaling in particular, are there, you know, ways that you recommend approaching journaling to intersect with liberation work? Are there particular prompts that you find really useful or <laughs> just as a practice? Um, I usually write the prompts for myself. So I have, I don't have any near me. Oh. I have these cards, which are writing prompts. Ooh, nice. Um, they're dear sister cards. And um, they are prompts for writing and reflection. And they're about freeing your voice. And so people use these cards and um, use those to journal with. Some folks use the cards and they use it to create art with, right? Whatever comes up from from um from the prompts for them. So I I start there and then I also you know as I'm reading books things bubble up for me. <coughs> Excuse me, questions um bubble up that I um use sometime. Last night I have a course a year long course called Freedom School and uh, at the end of it one of the participants said, you know, Desiree, I've been struggling with this question, like, what does it mean to be fully human? And we talk about that for a little bit. And, and I think it's questions like that, right? Like, as we are learning things that bubble up for us that are like, mm, this may, uh, this may pinch a little bit. It may poke, it may be a little bit of pokey that those are the questions I want to spend time with in my journal. When a question like that, I have to think you probably never fully feel like you've finished yeah. dealing with. Answer no. <laughs> no, right? And we were talking about like how, how 
basically, how do we keep our humanity in light of all these systems? Right. And I'm like, for me, and I think that does show, actually, now that you say it, I think it does show up in my journaling and in my art. It is whatever that thing in me that makes me feel like I'm better than somebody else or superior to somebody else, that that's my work to do. Um, right? Ways, yeah. what is what are the things that are keeping you humble? Mm-hmm. What are the things that, right? What is our ego and ways that we stay disconnected from each other? And so for, uh, that's, that's a lot of that kind of stuff is in my journals and in my, in my art. Yeah. And, you know, when you start looking at all of those systems and how they affect us, it can be so incredibly overwhelming because you suddenly see things that you never saw before. <laughs> and, and at least in my case, you know, it just sort of left me with this sense of dread because it seems like so much. And how can you possibly ever undo, unlearn, shift all of it. Are, are there, are there ways to kind of tackle that with journaling to get yourself back to, okay, I don't have to change the world myself. And yes, this is a big thing, but you know, you could do it one bite at a time rather than, you know, trying to eat, eat the whole elephant. So one of the things that Aaron taught me, like it's, it's about really imagining and envisioning the world that you want to see. But then it's also <clears throat> thinking about what's your place in that world? What's your role? Um, and then writing your narrative about that. For me, that's a, that's another big key too, right? It's like, I get to write my own narrative. And so, um, and narrative change in general is a good way to talk about power, right? To just rewrite that story. And so how are you using, I I think I use my journaling to kind of rewrite my story um, and rewrite the story of Black women in society in general. So I can imagine someone hearing that and saying, but isn't that just writing fiction? Yeah, no, it's not, right? Because we got to, we got to be able to dream it to make it come true. You got to be able to see it. Um, and I think was in that writing, right? Our, it's a strategy. So if this is where I'm trying to go, what are the steps? You know, if I'm kind of back engineering, what do I need to do to get there? Who, who needs to come with me? Oh, I like that question. Yeah, because we don't do this alone. So who do you, you know, I always talk about when we think about, um, what change looks like. One of the big questions is I always ask people like, what are you, what are you willing to destroy for liberation? Ooh, that's a good one too. And I always ask, what are you willing to build for liberation? Cause we don't just get to destroy. And who do you need beside you as you're building? I like the idea of pairing those because the, the idea of what are you willing to destroy feels really similar to me to that connection between accountability and punishment. You know, Mm -hmm. like if you have to give something up, okay. It it doesn't feel quite as painful if you realize that you get to build something else in place of it. Yeah. And that's also, you know, that empowering feeling again, like, Ooh, I get to design something to take that space. Yeah. And I think people only focus on what are we going to destroy, right? These systems need to come down. They absolutely do. They need to be burned to the ground. And what are we going to build? And that's what we don't spend enough time on is how are we building? What are we going to build? Do you think you can destroy and build at the same time? I do in some places. I think that there's some things that um, absolutely need to be burned down. I think there's some things that there can be some internal change. Um, but I do think we can do both at the same time. Um, yeah, if if folks are willing to spend all the work in the messy middle that comes from all <laughs> of that. But, um, but I was taught, 
another really critical piece to that destruction, the change, is conflict. And we think of conflict as being bad, but there's never been any transformation in the world without conflict. Period. Yeah. And so con- we have to think conflict not as something that happens, but as a key component to the transformation process. It's an essential piece to the process. Yeah, I think we associate conflict with negative outcomes too. Absolutely. And I think I tell people all the time, like all the pay transparency that now is happening in orgs, that's because people pushed and that there was conflict because somebody realized, oh, I'm getting way underpaid than these other folks. That the, yeah. the, that was nothing but conflict, right? That moved that kind of thing to happen that then had people doing looking at the qualitative and quantitative data that then had people doing assessments and saying oh god yeah our pay transparency is all whack we got to make this right with certain people we have to create policies to make sure that we're doing this right moving forward like transfer conflict did that yeah you know it's funny that you say that because my my first job out of college had a a strict policy that you were not allowed to discuss pay with anyone else. And, you know, I mean, at that age, I was, what, 22? So I didn't know any better. And I was like, well, I don't know that I really want to talk about this with anybody. Now, when I think back to what I was earning then, I should have been shouting at someone no, you should have been. about how well, little and, it and was. And that's how the system works, right? Yeah. The system tells you, you're, you're rude. That's not something you talk about. You don't do that here. And so it just keeps going. And it is that person that says, mm, wait. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Conflict is what moves the needle. And we have to see it again, not as something that's bad, but as an essential part of the, pro- of the change process. Yeah. Because you can't, you're, you're right. You can't change anything. You can't really grow anything. You know, if you think about it, literally, you can't grow anything. You can't, you cannot plant a seed if you have no conflict between the digger the and the soil. And all of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it does not happen. Yeah. Like the famous expression, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. You, you can't. Yeah. And, and so we have to be, yeah, we just got to be more open to that. How do you think we make people more comfortable with ideas like conflict and accountability? Um, those are muscles that we just got to learn how to grow, right? I, we need, um, I don't use the term safe space. I use more brave space. We need brave spaces where you can make mistakes again and know that, okay, Nancy, you're going to be okay in this conflict. And we also got to learn that Sometimes we won't be like we're. It's okay if I make a mistake, an honest mistake. I caused harm. I apologize. And that person says to me, I don't accept your apology. And I got to learn to move on with that. Yeah. And I don't think we spend enough time in those really uncomfortable moments. Just work in that muscle. I tell people all the time, like, are there relationships that I've lost that I absolutely regret? Yep. Because I did something stupid and they forgave me, but they didn't want to be in relationship with anymore. And I got to own that. Yeah. Uh, that's on me. Oh. Yeah, that's tough. And how do I, how do I show up better? How do I change that behavior? And, and I think also, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking we, we don't, we spend so much time learning how to judge each other, but we really don't spend time learning how to support one another. And so when you're talking about the brave spaces, there are environments where I'm trying to picture that happening and I really can't because everybody in that environment is so busy judging each other, looking out to be more superior to somebody else and tearing each other down that I have a very hard time imagining them saying, you know, oh, you made a mistake. It's okay. 
this is it. Do we want to be right or do we want to be in right relationship? Yeah. We don't always get to be both. Yeah. And, and unless we have more spaces where we can make mistakes, right? Because, you know, people I was talking to, I'm a board chair of a foundation and I was having a discussion and they were talking about, you know, a mistake that happened. And the ED said, wait, are we a learning organization? Because that's what our value says we are. And if we're a learning organization, then we show people grace when they make mistakes. Right? We give them the tools and the information they need so they learn from it. And I was like, that's exactly it. Yeah. And I think a lot of organizations haven't even asked if they are or want to be learning organizations. I think they say they do, but they don't do the work to really be one. Because the reality is to be a true learning org, there you have to be able to have agreements around shame, blame, and guilt. Yeah. Yeah, most people don't want to touch any of those things with a 50-foot pole. Nope. And again, we have organizations that says our leaders don't have to know any of these things. Right. For them to be successful. Yeah, because how are we defining success? Yeah. And who do we consider to be a leader? And what are those skills that we see in leaders? Yeah. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's very deep stuff. And I, you know, if we had more time, I would love to just go on and delve into all of that because I find it so fascinating. But I, I'm wondering if you have any, you know, if somebody wants to sit down with their own journal and delve into some of these things, do you have any particular prompts that you recommend or methods? Let me just pull Pull a card and okay. see if we get some bumps. So here's one. The question it says, it is our duty to live free lives. And so the question for self-reflection and journaling is, what is the biggest challenge you faced in living a free life? Um, we must speak truth publicly. Question for self-reflection and journaling. When did you learn not to speak up? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, do not live in fear of catching fire. That is exactly what you're here to do. Question for self-reflection and journaling. When did you fear becoming more important than your fire? When did, when did, your, when did fear become more important than your fire? Oh, that one gave me goosebumps. I have to get these cards. So, yeah, so those are those are some prompts for folks to start with. That's great. And I I really love that we kind of organically came to the whole subject of how creativity and, and liberation mirror each other. I was going to say feed off of each other, but I think mirror might be even better. It's a it's a healing process on both fronts. And I think if you can be, if you can be vulnerable in your creativity, you're much more likely to find a way to be vulnerable enough to do the kind of self-reflection work that comes when you pull out a pen and look in your journal, even if it doesn't make you comfortable, if it feels hard, if you're not sure you want to look at it, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the work for, for liberation. That's the work to getting us free. And that seems to me on, on a personal level as well as a collective level. Always. This work happens on the personal, the interpersonal, the institutional, and the collective. Which is how I come to, why wouldn't you want to feel more free? That's right. You know, when people fight the idea, it's like, I'm not seeing how this isn't a good thing for you as a, as an individual human before it's even a good thing for everybody else. But and this, this is why we, this is why we do it together, right? Like in seeing your freedom, I get to understand better about my own, right? Um, I can't think of the name of the woman who wrote the quote, like 
so many of us paraphrasing it like so many of us don't know we're in chains until we move for the first time. Mm. Yeah, because we don't see all of these invisible systems. We've grown up with them. We think that they're normal. And and I think half... And the chains maybe, feel normal. The chains right. feel normal. Right. We're so used to them that we don't even notice that they're there. It's like not noticing the air. And, and some of us are like, I know how to live with the chain, but what what does it mean to live, like, live without this chain? Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's scary. Absolutely. It's scary. It it reminds me a little bit of Plato's allegory of the cave. You know, you think that if you get out of the cave because you think that the only thing that's there is the shadow on the wall and that there's nothing else. And the people who get out but are forced back in are told that they're crazy. Yeah. And then they go crazy because they can't get back out again. Yeah. 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 So that's our work. Our work is ultimately freedom. Freedom for ourselves and freedom for the collective. That's fantastic. So, and and I do want to say before we finish, I took your whiteness at work course two years ago, and it's phenomenal. And I can't remember if you're still doing it in the summers, but yeah. if you are, I hope people will check it out because it's, it's yeah. an amazing experience. We're going to do it. It's actually going to happen this fall and not this summer, but we will be doing whiteness at work 2022. Absolutely. There is so much packed into that course. It's completely worthwhile experience. I'm glad you so, enjoyed it. Yeah. So oh, I'm, I'm glad you offer it. I think it's, it's a, great, a great doorway into lots of stuff that a lot of people who look like me have never had to think about before. Yeah. So it's if, great. if you're curious, you should check it out. So one final question. What's the best piece of advice you ever got? So I always tell people the best piece of advice that changed my life actually came from writer Toni Morrison. And it wasn't a piece of advice. It was just how Toni Morrison came at life and her writing. And Toni Morrison taught me not to live for the white gaze or the male gaze. I mean, that's what I learned from Toni Morrison. And, and that was so freeing. Yeah, Because what I do and how I show up is fully 100, not for white folks, not for men. If you're getting something from it, awesome, but it, it's, it's for me. And um, in learning that, that changed my life. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. 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 Like those two. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't live for that. Um, I have no expectations around those. And uh, yeah, it has given me a great, great amount of freedom. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking to me today. I have really found this a fascinating conversation and have enjoyed it a lot. And I hope that other people will start to sit down with a journal or look at their creative process and the ways that it's working for them in a whole new level than what they might have before. Mm. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Ah, you're very welcome. That's this week's episode. A big thank you to my guest, Desiree Attaway, and to you for joining me. If you enjoyed this episode, please pass it on. I hope you'll leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. See the link in your app for this episode to go right there. But in that review, please tell us about the more just, equitable world you want to build. You know, I talk to people all the time who are feeling totally lost, overwhelmed, and stuck creatively. And I know there are lots more of you out there who are feeling the same way. So I made something to help. Check out the link in your podcast app for my creative tune-up kit. It's 37 bucks, super affordable, and it's full of my favorite coaching tools to help you rediscover your creative self and make progress fast. I would love to get it into your hands so that you can get unstuck and create beautiful things this year. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. <laughs>